Right, let's let's kick off. I think it's we've we're over our start time. So well, Nosweta, welcome all. Thank you for linking in to us this evening. Um, we've got people here from all over the place, really. Um Wales, England, Scotland, and actually further afield as well. So we've got a few overseas people linked in as well. So thank you. The purpose of these webinars is hopefully to be fairly low key. Um, you can sit at home having your dinner um, or whatever you want to do. You can nod off. You can have, have a cup of tea and nobody will be there any otherwise because we can't see you. We just know the number of people on it, but you can see us. So we'll keep the cameras on for, for, for the speakers. And obviously, um, there will be plenty of opportunity. There is a, a, a question box that you can put, that you can type into. Um, and we do ask, um, because we can't put audios on for you, but if you have got questions as we go, please just type them into those, those question boxes. And Laurie Hopkins, who, who runs this for us, Laurie, or Jones, I should say, Laurie is in the background and she'll be monitoring those for us and we'll do our very, very best to answer them as we go for you. So now, Hopefully, we want to try and make this as practical and real to you as we can. So there is always a danger when we start talking about genetics and figures that people start to glaze over. But um, the reason we wanted to start with this one, which is the, gene the, the figures behind the rams, was to just give you a little bit of an insight into um, how we derive to some of the performance records we have in our sheep and how that's done in general, really, across the industry, be it with Signet, be it with Sill in New Zealand or Sheep Island. Um, it's all of those elements. It's a very similar approach in all of these, and Janet will cover that um, shortly for us. And likewise, um, we will um, cover lots of different things, lots of different traits, lots of different things on the horizon. So all of those things hopefully make a difference to you as farmers. But um, there will be a, a session in a minute where we'll ask you um, for some input, um, but not for a while. You can settle in first and, and Janet can, can kick off with us. So we should give you about an hour, hopefully. If it runs over, then it runs over. Um, if you're happy, we're happy with it all, obviously. So I'm going to introduce Janet Roden, who's on the screen here. So Janet's a geneticist. And I always say to people, what we've got, which is quite unique in the business, and we're very, very fortunate to have it, is that Janet is a farmer's daughter, a breeder's daughter. Um, and I've grown up, Janet, with, with sheep breeding. And that's vitally important to us because although Janet does all the high level um, analysis and tweaking of all the figures, it always comes back to the grassroots and Janet understands the grassroots and what makes a sheep a sheep, a good or a bad one. And that's really important because it's rarely we actually get people doing genetic evaluations that come from that very um, core background of sheep breeding. So we're very fortunate with Janet to give us um, very realistic figures and, and assumptions and development as we go. So enough of me, I'm going to pass over to Janet and, and she will do the majority of the speaking tonight. I'll just come in if we think there's a few questions or we need to clarify things. So Janet, all yours. Thank you, Dowie. Um, hopefully you can all see the screen. Um, so yeah, it's great to have you here. And we're just gonna talk through um, some of the figures behind the RAMs. Please use that Q&A box to ask questions. We, that's what we really want to be able to do is to be able to answer your questions and kind of direct things the way that you're interested in it going. Um, so I'll kick off, but feel free to ask those questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to start off with just talking a little bit about our goal. Um, so what we're actually trying to do in breeding these sheep. Um, hopefully it's quite familiar to a lot of you, but I think it's always worth, and we go back to this many times just to remind ourselves exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to breed rams um, that will perform and last um, in forage-based systems in the UK. Um, and we basically use performance records to do that as a tool. Um, so they're not the be-all and end-all, but they're a very useful tool to help us do that, to be able to assess those genetic traits that are going to really leave profit in commercial flocks. And our focus is very much on what's going to make a profit in a commercial flock. And we're thinking about that the whole time. Um, so that's very much what drives it. 
um, which may be quite different from um, a some pedigree breeders. Um, we're not in the pedigree market at all. It's all about thinking about what will drive profit in a commercial flock. And we're using data to help us make the right decisions um, to try and achieve that. Um, so I guess there are three kind of core principles that have um, dominated our thinking along those lines right from the very start when we set out breeding our own sheep um, probably 10, 15 years ago now, wasn't it, Gary? Um, so yeah, well, yeah, said, we, we started the whole genetics thing in about 2006, 2007. So, yeah, still very much work in progress, but yeah, the journey. Yeah. So forage fed has always been important. We've um, always seen that as, you know, what we should be feeding sheep. Um, the, the vast majority of their feed should come from the green stuff that we can grow on our farms. It helps us keep costs down. It makes us masters of our own destiny in a way. It keeps things within our control um, more than um, if we didn't do that. And um, we accept that, um, you know, in some situations, bought in feed has to be used, um, and some systems some bought in feed has to be used. But as far as possible, we want our sheep to be able to thrive and do well in systems that don't necessarily use any bought in feed. Um, as I said earlier, our focus has always been very much on what will work for a commercial flock. And so we think it's really, really important that not only when we're comparing sheep and making decisions about what to breed from, that we do it on the food we expect their progeny to eat, so forage, but we're also doing it in very commercial systems where they have the same sort of commercial pressure that sheep in a commercial flock would. So there's no molly coddling. Um, in the flocks we work with. But, and that's very deliberate um, because we want those sheep to be really tested in those commercial systems. So we can really pull apart um, the animals that genetically are suited to those systems. And our kind of third pillar was, we always considered it to be important, not only to think about the output of the sheep, but also what we were putting into them. Um, so really efficiency, thinking about that ratio of, yes, getting increased outputs, but not at any cost, thinking about the input. So we're actually getting more efficient sheep all the time. And I think those three principles have very much driven um, virtually everything we've done with our breeding lines. So if we go through that, if we think about it, first of all, about those forage based systems. So. We're, what we're trying to do is breed sheep that will thrive off grass and forage with little, if any, bought in feed. So for us, it's very important they are measured in that environment um, because that's where their progeny need to perform. Um, so we need to make sure animals are performing in that environment, and then we can be confident that when people buy rams, their lambs will perform in that environment without bought in feed. Um, and we do that using our own nucleus flock, which is run as a large commercial flock would be. We've got about 1,100 ewes tucked at um, Southfield near Hoyk in the Scottish borders. Um, and also in a number of breeding partners flocks um, where we're all trying to farm very well, but putting the sheep under pressure on forage based systems as they would be in commercial flocks to identify the genetics that do the job. Um, keep an eye on social media. Um, just at the weekend, we posted a nice little video of um, the sort of pressure our ewes are on at the moment at Southfield, our nucleus flock. So it's always worth looking at that. And that's where we're measuring the sheep. It will give you a good idea of how we do it. And we like to post those sorts of videos fairly regularly. Janet, it's probably worth adding that, you know, obviously if there's no grass, which we saw this year in, mm. in the summer, then we will always go to the next most cost-effective feed at our disposal. Um, so it's as efficient and as low cost as we can, but we're not opposed to putting feed into sheep if we have to, because these things obviously need to eat to perform. But those are extraordinary circumstances quite often as opposed to the norm. So, but just to clarify that really for people. Yeah, I guess we do it though with our commercial farmer head on rather yeah. than a 
pedigree breeder head on, don't we? Yeah. Um, so um, our breeding population, we've got quite a large breeding population, um, over 11,000 ewes were tucked last year and will be tucked again this year. Um, about 1,100 of those are at our nucleus block at Southfield near Hoyk. Um, and all the breed lines are represented there. Um, and then we've got about another 10,000 ewes that in breeding partner flocks spread throughout the country, as you can see in this map, when we go from um, Tain, north of Inverness, right down to South Devon with um, David Rossiter. Um, so a huge geographical variation, a quite a big variation of system as well. Um, they're all forage dominated systems. Um, I guess one thing that kind of unites them all, they're all bloody good farmers um, and know how to produce stock. Um, a number of very experienced breeders among them, but more than anything, they're just very efficient sheep farmers and they expect a lot of their stock. Um, and that's what we like to see um, because they're gonna put those stock under the commercial pressure to make sure they perform. So they farm their innovis breeding sheep as they would commercial sheep. And many of them have large commercial flocks as well. Um, so very hard commercial heads on all our breeding partners. Um, and so it, it, in the next webinar, Janet, we will be actually meeting some of these breeders. I think the next one we've got scheduled in a few weeks time is for you to actually meet and talk to some of these breeders so that you can actually get first hand their mindset, their philosophy. So again, we want to put them in front of you so you can actually understand what they're all about. Yep. Um, so between them, between us and them, um, we have about 17,000 lambs just over recorded per year. Um, and from that, um, we'll be selling um, around about 2,000 or hopefully just over sold per year. So there's a, a quite a high selection rate on those rams to get down to the ones that we're going to sell. Um, all the flocks are genetically linked. Um, so we make sure that um, we have some common genetics in all the flocks so we can actually compare animals fairly across them. And that way we can also check that our genetics are likely to perform in the kind of range of systems that our customers are likely to have as well, because we have a similar range within our breeding partners. So it gives us that chance to really make sure that they're robust and going to breed in those sorts of systems. Um, our genetic evaluations, um, we analyze all the data together. So all the animals are evaluated across the breeds or lines, and they have been since the start. So a little bit about um, some of the traits that we're recording, and these are really, really important for that element of efficiency, not only measuring the output of the animal, but also inputs. Um, so we do a huge amount of recording. Different flocks will record slightly different sets of traits, depending on the breeds they have, depending on their interests as well. Um, but the combination of them, there are some traits that will be recorded by all. So if we just kind of go in a kind of calendar year, we start off um, about this time of year when people are scanning. Um, and that scanning information is really important for us. We um, record it per individual U. Um, and we use that to um, re reference back to, to get accurate values, not only for the lambs scan per you, but also lambs born and lambs reared. So it allows us to know exactly what she had at scanning time and identify those losses really accurately. Um, and also use that disappear off. Um, we can find out exactly what happened to them. Um, we then kind of move on to lambing time. Um, and the traits that everyone will record is lambing ease is really important to us. We want lambs that are going to be born easily without much hassle. Um, their ability to get up and suck. And obviously, lamb survival is really important. We also make sure we check every lamb for entropion um, and record that if they have it and we mark them down so that we're not breeding from animals that had entropion. And we're also calculate a breeding value for entropion so we can breed against it. Um, 
We'll also in our maternal lines record maternal behavior um, and colostrum, whether it's adequate or not. Um, and Kim, um, who works with me as a geneticist, is currently doing her PhD, looking more at that maternal behavior element of it um, to try and refine what we're doing in that area. Some flocks will record other traits. So a lot of our flocks will also record birth weight because we like to monitor that. Some of the more extensively lambed flocks won't record that, um, but most do record it. And some flocks um, will record head cover um, because they're particularly worried about having bareheaded lambs um, in their particular environment. So they record that and we produce a breeding value for that to help them get sufficient cover on their lambs. Um, in a number of our flocks, we use DNA to assign parentage. Um, and so that will be taken at about four weeks of age on the lambs. Um, and then we can analyze the genotype and assign parentage. And we're beginning in our nucleus flock to also measure tail length of lambs at that stage with a view to building up data. So that can be something that we can breed for a shorter tail in future if we feel we need to. Um, through the growing season, um, we have a whole series of points at which we weigh lambs. Eight weeks is very important because at that point, what you're getting is a very good reflection of the ewes milkiness, um, as well as the lamb's ability to grow. But we'll also weigh lambs at weaning um, when they're about six weeks, 16 weeks old, and we also do ultrasound scanning and any replacement stock is weighed throughout the first winter, both ewe lambs and ram lambs, so we can track growth through that. Um, we get to about May, June time, and we start going through our potential sale rams in great detail, having checked them at a number of points before in the year, but this is the final time at which we do an MAT. Um, we'll record a yearling weight on them, um, also measure scrotal circumference, and keep a very tight record of why we're culling animals. Um, so we have that information that we can build in to breeding decisions in the future. Um, we'll use ultrasound scanning of muscle and fat to get an idea of carcass potential on every lamb we can. And we're very particular that we scan everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so we get a measure over the whole population. So we're not selective about it in any way. Everything gets measured. Um, and that's really, really important to get good unbiased breeding values. And we'll also use whole body CT scanning for a small number, about 50 or 60 lambs a year um, to give us very detailed measures of muscle and fat content and also muscle density, which is related to intramuscular fat, so marbling, um, which is important for our Abervale line, which has is bred for meat eating quality and is specifically bred for the Pilgrim's Waitrose supply chain. Um, Throughout the year at convenient points, we do a number of um, scores on animals such as foot scores. So whether which are both the shape of the foot, overgrowth in the foot, the health of the foot, um, mouth and jaw scores. So jaw position, tooth angle, tooth length, um, DAG scoring so we can breed cleaner sheep. Um, we'll do fecal egg counts and serum IgAs on all our replacement females in the nucleus flock and a number of um, the breeding partner flocks will also do that so we can breed for nematode resistance. Um, we do some breach scoring to identify animals with clean breaches, so limited wool around the tail and also um, the extent of fleece shedding um, as we develop shedding lines. Um, new weights and body condition scores very important to us so um, every flock or every maternal flock will measure those at pre-tupping and weaning and body condition score as well as weight is important. Um, but a number of flocks, in fact, quite a lot of the flocks will do it at a number of different points through the year. So we can really track that and it helps us breach ewes that are going to hold their condition well. Um, and finally, last but not least, um, ewe longevity, a very, very important trait. Um, and to record that accurately is quite difficult. Um, so we track all our ewes through the flocks. And even if they then get demoted from a breeding flock into a commercial flock, we try and track them 
um, as much as we can and assign reasons for death or culling to them so we can get a good measure of their genetic potential for productive life. So lots and lots of recording going on through the year and lots and lots of data feeding in. Janet, just before you go on, there's a question come up, which we might as well answer, probably to the previous slide, which is, Sean has just asked the question, does it make things difficult comparing animals when they're reared on different systems throughout the UK? Um, well, I guess that's a really good question. And um, at its simplest level, I guess we could say, yes, it does. I guess it would be easier if everything was reared on the same system. But we're breeding rams for people farming them in different systems throughout the UK. Um, so we need to know that they're going to perform in all those different environments. And so in that sense, um, I guess it does make it a little bit more complicated, but it's absolutely vital to do that. Um, and the statistical techniques we have, um, as long as we've got those genetic connections between flocks, allow us or allow the statistics that go into the breeding value calculations to take account of those differences so we can compare animals fairly um, and that's really important and we also make sure janet only that there's good linkages between these flocks where there's common sires used through them all yeah absolutely those those genetic linkages are absolutely vital to making that work and we do work quite hard um, at doing that um, we, we keep an eye on it and, you know, we will say we need to use a ram from this flock in this flock um, to create those linkages. Yeah, and I suppose a good example of that would be let's use Aberfield and there will be genetics used in, for example, one of our flocks in Hereford um, and up in Southfield and obviously the conditions lambing outdoors on, on a sort of an upland unit in Southfield are probably slightly more challenging than they will be in Hereford. But those same genetics will be across both flocks and that information is fed into Janet when she does those evaluations. So it, it sort of evens itself out. It gives us the sort of handle on them in the different environments, doesn't it, Janet? So Yeah, absolutely. And it is important that we know how they perform in those different environments. Um, so great question, Sean. Thank you. Um, so we're collecting a heap of data. So in 2022, we had about 17 and a half thousand lambs that we recorded. And in the year on them and their mothers, we had over 400,000 bits of data that we recorded on them. So it's huge amounts of data. Um, but the, with that data comes a lot of power um, to tell us exactly how things are performing and be very objective about it. Um, but it's only good if that data is accurate. Um, so it's really, really important to us um, to make sure we've got accurate data. And so we put, do an awful lot to make sure that data is accurate. And that kind of, you know, in four main themes. So in terms of data collection, um, and we all know quite a lot can go wrong at data collection level, we use EID wherever um, possible. And um, our technicians at Invis are, um, very skilled in using EID and support our breeding partners in using it. A lot of our breeding partners are very skilled with their EID equipment as well, but we use EID as much as we can. There's no bits of paper flying around if we can avoid it. Um, everything's done electronically um, to get really accurate records. And for all the traits that we record, we have very closely defined protocols. Um, so, and all the scores that are validated, um, we check them out against any scientific research that's done. And we keep a close eye on kind of international standards for those sorts of protocols as well. So there are some international recording organizations and we regularly look at their guidelines to make sure that we're following those and recording traits in up to standard. Um, traits like the ultrasound scanning um, our own technicians do that, and they're all trained and accredited by Signet, who do that. Um, and as many of you will know, they also now do that as a service for the, much of the rest of the industry, um, contracted in by Signet to do that. Um, they do scan a lot of sheep, and that's important for maintaining accuracy. Um, so it's something that we've always been very keen on. 
Janet, can I just, there's a question related to scanning, and since there's a picture of Ross scanning there, it's probably appropriate to ask it now. Um, Stuart has asked the question, um, what's the justification for using 16-week scanning wait as a predictive variable, not say, for example, 20 or 25 weeks? Okay, so what we actually do is what we want to do is scan animals when they're as close to the weight that a commercial farm would be sending them off for slaughter as possible. 40 to 42 kilos, um, because that's what we're trying to improve. We're trying to improve the carcass of the lamb at that weight, in that weight bracket. Um, so our experience tells us that um, on average, most of our breeding partners' flocks, lambs are gonna be at that sort of weight on average at about 16 weeks. If we've got a flock that grows particularly quickly, they'll be scanned earlier. If they're lower, growth rates, they'll be scanned later. So we say it's 16 weeks, but in reality, we work with the flock to find out when the average weight in the flock is gonna be 42 kilos. And that's when we go in and scan because we want to keep that commercial focus on the commercial lamb. And there's normally enough variation, Janet, at that stage, isn't there, to get the slightly fatter sheep away from the leaner ones, most of the time anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if we took it to 2025 20, um, weeks, which um, is probably a more traditional time to scan, um, it has changed more recently, but um, some lambs would be way past their weight at which they would normally be killed on a commercial farm, and we wouldn't be getting a good reflection of that. Um, we might be getting huge muscle deaths, um, which might make people feel um, very special. Um, but it's not really a good reflection of what that ram is intended to do. Um, so that's why we scan then. So again, a really good question, and thanks for that. Um, so we, that's how we try and maintain quality of collection at collection. Um, and with new breeding partners or if people are recording new traits, um, we'll tend to spend a little bit of time supporting them and help them, training them to do that. And our technicians are often, um, we work closely with Focus Genetics in New Zealand, um, and many of our technicians will spend time with Focus Genetics, also learning from their data recording systems to help bring in new skills as well. Um, then data submitted to us, um, and that is also a very, very important point for us in terms of checking that data. Um, so any data that's submitted is very carefully checked. Um, we check it to make sure there aren't outlying values. And if there are, we query them. Um, if there's been an exceptionally good or an exceptionally bad lamb, someone's going to have noticed it. Um, so if we see exceptional values, we go back and say, is this correct? Because it's not it's looking a little bit odd. And so we, we're always checking everything. We check every animal um, that its ID follows through, and we check its performance against its previous performance to make sure that things are making sense so that we can quickly spot if something has gone wrong. So there's a huge amount of checking that goes on. Um, any data that comes in is kind of summarized into benchmarking type figures um, almost immediately and sent back to the um, shepherd that submitted it. So they have that data to work with, but also, if that looks out of kilter with what they expect, what we expect, we're going to notice it very quickly um, and pick up where there's been a problem. So a lot of checking in the data. And I guess one of um, our advantages being a relatively small population that we're dealing with compared to some of the um, commercial genetic evaluation um, labs is that we can do that. We have that relationship with the breeders um, and we can check in great detail. So we're also very um, particular that data is complete so that all animals are recorded. As I said, the good, the bad and the ugly. And again, there's a huge amount of checking to check that's done. So if animals um, suddenly disappear, we're asking why are these animals not being recorded? If they've died, we wanna know about it. If you're not recording them, we want to know why you're not recording them. Um, so the whole batch, the whole management groups are always recorded all the way through. Similarly with ewes, we follow them through 
we always want to know why an animal hasn't been recorded so we can make sure that data is as complete as possible. And finally, we use um, data quality reports to monitor um, the quality of data, const which are constantly updated, um, and also to feed that back um, to the shepherds and breeding partners that are doing recording so they can see how their data quality is shaping up compared to their usual standards um, and compared to other people's, other breeders within the system as well. And it does get quite fiercely competitive over the quality of the data um, that people are submitting to us. And I can put my hand on my heart and tell you it is very, very high quality, all of it. Um, here we've actually got um, some graphs of the type of data quality that we're getting. So we've got the maternal size, which we score out of 10 on their data quality. And this is number of flocks up the side of the graph. Um, and the meat size, which we score out of five in terms of data quality. And you can see that the vast majority of our flocks are scoring at maximum score, which is actually really hard to achieve. And many of them have worked really hard to get there. Um, and we've seen a general progression towards more and more flocks getting into those very high categories year on year. Occasionally things go wrong and we get some with low data quality scores, um, but that's also important for us. And we can make a decision if we have um, data that doesn't meet our standards, we can make a decision about whether we include that in the evaluations or not. Um, if we feel it's going to bias the evaluations or make anything unfair, um, we will not actually use it. We record it, but we don't use it in the evaluations if we think data quality is not high enough. Um, so that also puts a very strong incentive on everyone recording data to make sure that data quality is good um, so that it is included in evaluations. Um, and then what do we do with that data? Well. We use that data in a lot of ways, but its primary purpose for us is to be able to calculate the estimated breeding values or EBV so we can judge which animals are the best to breed from. So how do we do that? Well, we will have individual records of animals, their weights, their lambing ease, their lambing percentage, all those sorts of things. Um, we'll have a lot of information on the pedigree of animals, so their sire, their dam, and because we know that, all our other relatives, and performance records on tens or actually now hundreds of thousands of animals that are related to each other. And those, of course, are all telling us about the genes of animals that are related to. And we also have that information on the environment the animals have been reared in, so which flock they've been reared in, and things like the age of the mother, which is obviously going to influence lamb's performance, whether it was reared as a single or twin, which management group it was in, all that sort of thing. So we have all that data that we can use to get these fair estimated breeding values that will allow us to rank the animals for each trait in terms of their genetic potential. And then we combine that information um, in an analysis that's called BLOP analysis, which is the industry standard way of doing it, um, to give us the EBVs. And it's just a statistical method of making the best use um, of that data to give us unbiased predictions of animals' breeding values. It takes a lot of calculation on the computer. Um, it's like solving a whole heap of simultaneous equations, about 160,000 of them. Um, so you need a good computer to do it, but that's basically how we're calculating the EBVs. Um, so a little bit more about the genetic evaluation at Innovis. Um, we do all our own genetic evaluations, um, and we have done since the start, but we use industry standard software and analysis to do it. Um, there's a number of reasons why we've done it ourselves from the start. Um, one of them being that from the start, we wanted to be able to do an across breed um, analysis within our own population, um, which we couldn't do with any other of the other providers. So we've always done that. Um, and the breeds are comparable within our population. They're not comparable um, to other populations, but then other breeds and other populations aren't comparable to each other either. 
So we didn't feel we were losing out too much on that. It means we have a very short pipeline to integrate new research and new EBVs. And um, particularly when we set out, we had a number of breeding values that we felt were very important that weren't standard in the industry, such as lamb survival, lambing ease, suckling ability. And we're always identifying new areas that we think actually we, this is something we should be breeding for. We should develop an EBV. And doing it ourselves allows us to do it very quickly and bring it into use very quickly, as soon as we're happy um, that it's working well. Um, and we've actually found that um, certainly Signa have adopted a lot of the breeding values that we started with, as they realised that it's something that they can record and use themselves. Um, it also means that every selection index that we um, use, and now a selection index will combine the breeding values for different traits into one score to rank animals. And it means we can optimise those so they really maximise improvement for our customers, um, who I hope you know quite well. And it, we can really keep that focus on that commercial flock, putting sheep under pressure on a forage based system and thinking about those financial returns and the amount of work required to keep those animals. And it means we can review those and update them really regularly. It's quite a big job to do that. Um, and I actually do it a little bit for Signet as well. So I kind of know how big a job it is, but it means doing it in-house, we can do that much more regularly. Um, and we express our breeding values on a five-year rolling average um, rather than a fixed point in time, which is more usual in other sheep evaluations. That's something we do a little bit differently, but it's something that we feel is more relevant to commercial flocks, because what you're doing is you're comparing animals to the sorts of animals that you will have already in your flock and be able to make that comparison rather than to an animal that you had 10 years ago or whatever. So it keeps it more current. Canada, there's a few questions which I think would be good to cover while we're on this slide before we, we move on. Yep, great. Um, one of them while we're on the data is um, how do we ensure internal data analysis isn't biased? You know, do we have any external players who analyze the data to ensure accuracy? We don't have any external players who analyze the data to ensure accuracy. Um, we do also record um, a number of our flocks are also recorded on Signet um, so that we know animals will be available with Signet figures for people that want those. Um, and so we can always match against that. Um, they don't rank identically. I wouldn't expect them to rank identically because our breeding objectives and indexes are slightly differently, but they're broadly similar. So that kind of gives us a check on it. Um, but I think ultimately, um, the most important thing for us is what we want to do is produce animals that are going to perform on people's farms. And if our figures were biased, um, we would be getting caught out constantly. You can't cheat the system. Um, so, and that doesn't happen. The, you know, animals perform as they rank in our evaluations, pretty much. Um, so I think that keeps us honest as well. Yeah, and there's there's a couple of points probably just to, to add to that. What one is that, as Janet says, you know, our individual breeding partners aren't competing in the ring to try and get you know ten thousand quid for a, for a tub. They're actually producing these sheep contractually, really, for Innovis to sell out there. And our objective, as Janet rightly says, is to make sure that we can actually improve performance on customer farms. And we put that top priority, really. So we do everything we can to make sure that people are getting better sheep all the time within all of that. That said, um, we do have a slight um, distance between Janet, Kim, and, and the genetic evaluation team, for example, and the sales team. So, for example, Janet will stick wholeheartedly to her guns of penalising a sheep if the records aren't accurate or good enough and won't, will probably um, pull down its overall index. Now, obviously our sales um, teams would like to sell everything with good figures, but we have that, if you like, internal element as well, where 
we're very, very anal about the, the integrity of the data and how that's done. So there's plenty of times where I think, oh, Janet, really? But that's what it ends up being because that's that's what keeps everything straight and honest with us, really. Um, so I think it, it's fundamentally, you know, our, our target is to actually give customers better sheep and see differences and impact on their farms. So really, it would be very short-lived for us if we were doing anything other than that. Um, there is a, an associated question. So hopefully that goes part way to answering your question. Um, there is another question, Janet, which is how do we determine what to cull and do we have a control group to compare against? And that probably hones in on that last point of the rolling five-year average, although obviously we have structures and stuff that's separate to that, but no control groups as such, Janet. There's no there's no control groups as such, but I guess everything in a way is its own control, isn't it? Um, so culling, I mean, I guess, in some ways, we there are two different processes going on. Um, culling, figures aren't everything by any means. And there's an awful lot of culling of sheep that goes on um, in terms of their structure, um, health, behavior, all sorts of things. The sort of culling any good shepherd would do or any good breeder would do. Um, the figures are then a tool that's used alongside that. Um, and we do, there, there, there will be for particularly some traits, there will be kind of minimum standards and we will say that anything below this particular level has to be culled um, because that allows us to um, have some level of quality assurance. Um, but grad, usually it's a case of um, selection in terms of um, selecting the better animals. Um, we've learned over a long period of time that breeding from animals in the bottom 25% of our population, remember this is kind of bumping up year on year because we use a rolling average, um, are not a lot of use to us and so they tend not to get bred from, um, but there's no hard and fast rules from it. So if you've got an animal that's in the bottom 25% that's absolutely stunning on type or bring something else to the party, then they stay in the population. I don't know, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it, it's quite a painful process, um, Peter, yeah. to ask the question because we end up culling far too many animals, really, and I would love it if we culled less. But to give an example, out of about 7,000, 8,000 plums on the ground, there'll be about 3,000 that will go into winter to grow on. But that won't finish there. We will continue trying to pull them apart through winter by actually trying to grow them off on forage. Um, and under pressure, so always behind wires, always in fairly big groups. So that 3,000 will probably drop down to about 2,400, 500 by the spring. We will have culled all the way through. We'll do our final MOTs in June, and then that'll probably still pull down to close on 2,000 that are sold. So there's a huge amount of wastage in the whole process, really. Um, and that's really to try and make sure that the sheep that get through are deserving to get through. If they'll actually do a job for people, both in terms of their ability to breed and their ability to thrive in various conditions. Um, when we do look at culling reasons for sheep, we normally take anything that's structurally wrong, pastons, mouths, um, out, without even looking at indexes. And then we base the selection cull then on the grade. And that grade is based on an index as opposed to individual breeding values, which I'm sure Janet will cover indexes again shortly. So, um, yeah, it's a fairly uh, harsh, relentless way of pushing these sheep through. Um, and that five-year rolling average is something quite important, really, because lots of breeds out there that are recording will be referring back to an average, maybe 10 years ago, some even longer. But we thought, well, that's really relevant. And so this year's data adds to that to the valuations the sixth year ago drops off and that average effectively goes up every year which again janet i think we'll talk about shortly so by the nature of it um the self-regulating because the sheep are getting better every year in their performance um and that means that we're culling more of the bottom end all the time as a consequence so i'm not sure if that answers the question but it, it's that's the element to it anyway um, Stephen, I'll come to your question later on when Janet's sort of touching on those. So, 
I, th I think the other element on culling is um, because most of our breeding partners also have large commercial flocks, they're absolutely ruthless on their ewe populations. I um, mean, they will go through every year. Um, and if a ewe um, is either not there on index or so she's, some of them will say below average on index, but you know, certainly in the bottom 25% on index um, or they've offended them in any way um, in terms of type, how they've behaved at the previous lambing, feet, anything, they get dropped into the commercial flock. Um, we can then keep tabs still on their um, performance in most of those flocks, but they're not contributing to the breeding population. Um, and then there is some ruthless culling that goes on every year. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, so the selection indexes. Um, so we have a selection index that's specific to each line. Um, because every line's bred for a different purpose, really, um, to meet a different need um, out there in flocks. Um, but the breeding goal is always, always, always commercial production efficiency. Um, maybe in slightly different circumstances, slightly different definitions, but that's what it is. And the selection index basically is just a way of combining all those different EBVs for different traits into one score that allows us to identify the sheep that are good all-rounders um, and also to identify the sheep that are dreadful all-rounders so they get culled. Um, so, for example, I've got a couple of examples up here. So the Aberfield Index. Um, so there we're really thinking about key traits that are going to affect profit, both in terms of the daughters of the Aberfield rams, but also the weather lambs, um, because that's an important element of return for people using the Aberfield. So a lot of emphasis goes on the number of lambs reared, so you're getting increased output from daughters and their mothering ability, um, so that she'll milk well and influence the lamb's growth up to weaning. Um, but there's also a good chunk of emphasis going on the growth and carcass, because that's important not only for the daughter's lambs, but for those weather lambs. Um, so we're making sure that that's always moving forward. And then again, a good chunk of emphasis on those vigor and health traits. So the things that are really influencing how much time you're having to put in at lambing time, lamb survival and nematode resistance. Um, so in most of our maternal indexes, there's about 10% emphasis actually goes on that nematode resistance to keep FEC levels down and keep them reducing. And then in all our maternal indexes, and we've kind of got a little break um, that runs on the index because most of those traits, when you're trying to breed sheep that have more lambs, that they grow better, produce more milk, inevitably you end up with bigger sheep um, and bigger ewes. And we know that's the one of the main elements of cost in a flock. So we have a little break on all the maternal indexes that just restricts his changes in new weights. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but that's a really important element. Um, our meat size, such as the Abermax, and we'll have a, probably a slightly simpler index with less traits in it. Um, they'll all have some element of lamb growth because obviously that's really important for a meat sire. Um, muscle and fat because of the carcass of the quality and the weight of the carcass. Um, so they, they'll be the really important traits in that index. But they also all have um, traits that related to lambing ease and lamb survival, which we combine into a lambing sub index. Um, because it's the number of lambs you sell is one of the biggest determinants of your profit. Um, so it's really important with those terminal sires that we're actually also breeding them that are going to have lambs that survive well and actually get to market. Um, so the index is just a way of doing that overall ranking. Um, and by selecting on the index, it gradually pulls up all the traits that are important um, for that particular line. Janet, it's probably worth noting that we rarely penalise on fat sheep, do we? Especially no. on internal traits. No, we do. In what in in the Abermax Max index, there's a very slight negative um, weighting on fat, but it's very small. Um, and when we look at the genetic changes, you'll, you'll actually kind of see why we do that um, in that line. Um, but our general 
principle is what we're aiming for is to maintain the average fat level at about where it is. Um, that allows people then to choose to go for an animal with a slightly higher fat breeding value or slightly lower, depending on how they might want to change their carcasses. Um, and we're always very concerned that if we're selecting hard for muscle and growth in an animal, we also need those animals to finish um, and ideally finish with a kind of 20 kilo carcass. So we're not getting penalties for overweight lambs. Jana, just one very quick question while the indexes are up. Stewards asked the question there, what weighting does each sort of sub-index contribute to the overall meat index? In other words, what weightings are those components within the index on the meat one specifically? So on the meat one, um, it will vary between the lines, but the kind of the way that kind of pie is divided up for the Avamax kind of reflects the relative weighting. So the majority of the weighting is going on growth and muscle, and they're kind of getting equal weighting. Fat's getting a very small weighting in it, but it is in there. And then about just under about a quarter of the weighting is going on that lambing sub-index to make sure those lambs are hitting the ground easily and surviving. Does that answer the question? Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, and then there's a, there's slight modifications to that with Abba Black and the Primera, isn't there? Yeah, so there's slight with slightly different emphasis, depending on what we think is important for that particular breed and how it fits into people's production systems. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so lots of numbers um, go feeding in. As I said, they're tools, and that's all they are. They're tools to help people make good decisions. Um, they don't make the decisions for us, and they shouldn't make the decisions for you. They're tools to help you make those decisions. So what's it actually mean for RAM buyers? What it, what it means for our customers that they should be confident that our breeding decisions are based on good objective data, uh, but with a good measure of stockmanship thrown in there as well. Um, so, as I said, it's a tool. The data doesn't make the decisions. We use the data to help us make decisions. Um, it also means that you've got that data available. To, so you, on individual rams, you can match the ram to specific flock requirements. Or if people are wanting us to choose rams for them, they can tell us what they need for their flock. And we can go out and find the ram based on those, that objective data that we think will do the job well for them. Um, and that's really quite important. It gives you that ability to tailor exactly to your flock. And every flock is different. Every flock's a different system, a different farm, has slightly different objectives. And it also means that we're using that good data to make our breeding decisions. Um, and we can make sure that our breeding flocks are always making good genetic progress. Um, you can be confident of that. We're constantly monitoring it. Um, and that we're constantly improving. So the rams that we're offering for sale are getting better in terms of the performance they're going to throw to, through to their lambs every year. Um, so it's a kind of constant improvement going on. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Dowie on this one. Yeah, and I suppose we're just going to ask you to just Give us a few answers shortly. Um, one of the key things, as Janet says, is that, for example, an ABBA field can range in its scanning percentage, its prolificacy, from, say, minus um, six or seven to about plus 20 percent, based on that sort of average zero being sort of 180, 185. So when it, it always amuses me when to talk, people talk, especially quite often out of context about, oh, an ABBA field isn't big enough for an ABBA field, isn't prolific enough or too prolific, whichever. The reality is that within our ABBA field population of about 700 ABBA field rams sold every year, you can actually choose based on this information, an ABBA field that would scan at just over 200% or an ABBA field cross that will scan at 170%. So it always, um, intrigues me when people talk about a breed in general, whereas actually within all of these lines we have, you can actually hone in on those breeding values to actually determine what you want to fit your flock. But quite often when we when we have this discussion with farmers, 
And we ask, well, what is the target? What is the sort of objective for the flock in terms of, of certain key sort of indicators? It's quite often sort of something that's overlooked. It's something that people are so busy farming that we rarely stop and think what we're actually doing. So I think we're going to just put a bit of a, of a poll up, I think, um, just to get you woken up if you've had your dinner and you're a little bit lethargic by now. So just a little bit of thinking time. It's not a test. It's just asking you, really. So one of the key things, really, as a driver to your flock in terms of its cost, because a ewe will always eat about 2.5% of a body weight. So a 90 kilo ewe is going to eat quite a bit more than a 60 or 70 kilo ewe. And you've got that ewe for 365 days of the year. And obviously, you want to produce that 20 kilo carcass. So we're talking about lowland systems predominantly here. Um, so one of the key questions when I ask farmers or groups is, well, what is actually the average you weight of your flock? If you were to weigh them pre-tupping, uh, sort of a month, two, three months ago, what would the average weight in your flock be? So we'd love it if you could actually tick opposite those boxes. There's a below 50 kilos, which some of the hill use may well be, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. You'll see the ranges, and there's even... 80 to 90 and over 90 kilos. And obviously some of the sort of the terminal side across use will be up there. So we'd love it if you could tick one of those boxes just to give us an idea of your weights with people. Um, if you don't know, then obviously tick, you don't know. But I would suggest if you don't know, then it's a really good exercise to actually understand what the weight of the flock is. And hopefully you've got a consistent in a flock that you can make that assumption that you haven't got a, a lick resolve sort of a 40 kilo U and an 80 kilo U because they're very difficult to manage unless they're distinct flocks. So that's the first question. We'd love for you to tick one of those for us, please, if you could. And we'll show the poll at the end just to give us an idea of, of what U weights are out there. The second question is, is what sort of lambing losses do you get? And again, this is something we, we tend to sort of forget because we're busy we scan and we either get a good or a bad scanning obviously um you know that determines the number of lambs we've got in there but there are lots of things that erode away from our rearing percentages and really for us it's what what the losses are from what you've scanned when the scanner's with you that day to when you've weaned your lambs where have those lambs gone and again if we'd love if you could tick some of those for us obviously um there's below 5%, which is virtually impossible, I would suggest, to most people. Um, there's 10, 15, 15 to 20 over 20. So this is from what you've scanned, the number of lambs you predicted in your use today, 170, 180, whatever it is, 150, to what you think you're weaning off those use. And again, if you don't know, then please tick don't know, because it's a really useful tool for us again. And that's quite often a really good indicator of a system for us that could be tweaked, some breeding objectives that could be modified, or even some disease issues that are hindering the flock. So these are real key things that, that really it's good for you to think through. Quite good if you talk to a vet, if you've got a good proactive vet, to actually go through with it. And likewise, the third and final question, because we don't want to overdo it with you, is what's your flock's replacement rate? So if you've got a thousand ewes, are you pulling in less than 200? So below 20%, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, over 30%. And again, if you could tick there, hopefully you will know this because you know the number of replacements, you're either breeding or buying, but that'd be really useful if you can give us that idea on that. And just as an indication again for you there, um, quite a lot of the work that's that's been done, you know, most of the losses seem to occur in ewe flocks from yearlings to tooth ewes to the second lambing. That's when the most attrition happens. But if you've got disease like yonis in your flock, for example, you'll find that that your replacement rates are much higher in that 25 to 30 or even over 30 percent. So it could be something as an iceberg disease munching away at the U flock if you're at that sort of level. Um, so again, just a useful indicator just to give us an idea on that, really. So I'm hoping, I've talked quite a bit there, so I'm kind of hoping that that we've got those in, Lori, so you can probably um, put those up for us when you get a chance. Well, that's reassuring. 
I assume everybody can see that on the screen. Um, there's a few of you with with use below 50, but I would imagine that they're going to be hardy hill use up in 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 either um, North Wales or the lakes or somewhere. 50 to 60. The majority of you are sitting at 60 to 70 kilos, which we would say is optimum weight for most systems, because that 60 to 70 kilo you will get as that 20 kilo lamb with the decent terminal sire on her. A few of the ewes starting to get a little bit heavier, um, 70 to 80. And suddenly those 80 to 90 kilo ewes, they really need to be justifying their place to actually um, be there with you. Now, I know people will say, oh, well, she's worth more as a cull ewe. But actually, if if you're actually getting five or six years worth of production from that ewe, the kill ewe is spread way into the distance. And her cost at that stage is going to be much, much higher. So interesting to see that if you are at the higher end, we always urge you to push down towards that 60 to 70 mark if you can. Obviously, some of the hill ewes can't do that because of, of the, the topography and where they're farming. So that, that's not as relevant uh, for them. Um, when we look at lamb losses, my goodness, some of you are below 5%. Now, that is some farming. Um, there's very few that can actually achieve that, truly. So again, you know, to, to be at that level is is phenomenal, really. Um, bear in mind that things like wet dries, you know, sheep that are scanned in lamb that end up at the end of lambing that haven't got lambs on them are normally culprits we keep missing. Um, and a lot of people there in that sort of band, again, you know, that 5, 10, 10 to 15. So there's some bloody good farmers on this call tonight, I would say, in terms of keeping those losses there. Um, something like abortions, borders disease can have a huge impact on this, for example. So borders disease can give us 20% losses without trying too much. Things like Compilobacter, which is hounding our nucleus lock up in Scotland, pushes our losses to over 20% in the nucleus in Scotland. Um, and we've defined them because we post mortem dead lambs to understand um, what's going on with those. So again, just an interesting uh, look there just to see where people are sitting. Um, you replacement rates. And again, the ones of you that are achieving under 20% are doing really, really well. And not only is it cost effective for you because you've got less younger ewes on the farm, less wastage, less unproductivity, especially if you're not tipping them as you lambs, but you've also um, having quite a, an important impact on the environment because we know that you replacement rates is one of the real big drivers, as is you weight, as is lamb losses for the carbon auditing of your flock and the farm. So again, you know, being at that level, it, it's it's very good. 20 to 25, again, that's probably the norm in the UK generally, which would be reflected here. Um, and as we start getting over that 25 to 30 and over 30, uh, you really need to start having chats with the vets just to see what's going on in there. Um, we've got a question on the chat here in terms of do we compare you wastage rate across systems of rearing situations? Is this something we can use produce an EBV for? So Janet, you might want to just talk quickly about longevity EBV just briefly on this one, maybe. Yeah, I will. And I'll also pick up Stephen's question about FEC in a minute yeah. as well. Um, so so yes, we do um keep as close records as we can of you wasted rates um, across the systems. Um, so we can compare it um, and we know exactly how many use we're losing, when we're losing them, why we're losing them. Um, and we do produce an EBV for it. Um, it's one of those things that is actually really difficult to record um, and record accurately. So there's a lot of effort goes into recording it. And from a genetics point of view, in, it's quite a difficult trait in that you really need to kind of like two generations of use to go through the system before you get any real accuracy. And you really want two generations of those ewes that are going to live out their natural life in the flock as well, give you five, six crops of lambs um, before you kind of have a really good um, judgment. So it takes a long time to build up. Um, so we have um, a longevity EBV that we have been using for a breeding partners um, alongside all their other EBVs for two or three years now. Um, and 
um, have, it's gradually increased in accuracy and we've learned how it works and it's beginning to pull sheep apart and we can actually then relate that back to phenotypic so actually how animals perform on farm and it makes sense so we're now at a stage with it where we're going to introduce it into our indexes um, and I think that illustrates quite well the way we often work with these things um, that we'll develop an EBV but it's not until that we're confident of its accuracy um, and that it's it's making sense and it is actually relating to what we're seeing happening on farm that we actually put it into the index and use it more widely um, for our customers. So at the moment, what we will do is we identify the best animals in terms of longevity and they'll be starred up in catalogs. Um, but as I said, the next job is to put it into the index and that's a job for the winter for me. Um, so that's that one. And I'll also pick up um, Stephen's question who asked about FEC um, and IGA. Um, so we measure serum IGA, so that's the antibodies that the sheep produce, the lambs produce against the um, worm larvae. Um, and it's another way of kind of increasing the accuracy of our selection for um, sheep that are resistant to nematodes. Um, Stephen's asking if there's much relationship between those two measures um, and much difference in the heritability of the trait. Um, We'll be honest, we've only been recording serum IGA for two years now. Um, and certainly looking at the data um, in a kind of fairly simple way, it doesn't look to us like there's much relationship, but I wouldn't expect to see the sort of relationship with the number of records we have. I would want a kind of thousand records or more before I was really delving into that. And so we're waiting to build up that data to do it. In terms of heritabilities, um, we get a heritability fairly consistently for fecal egg counts, individual fecal egg counts of about 0.16 or 16%. Um, we measure them relatively old in lambs compared to some people. So we will do it when the lambs are at least six months old, which is actually the recommendation, but many people do it earlier than that. Um, and we have seen quite nice genetic trends in reducing fecal egg count. And really what we're aiming to do with that is exactly that, reduce fecal egg count. So we have sheep on farm that when they're challenged with worms are gonna shed less eggs out to infect everybody else. Um, so that's what we're kind of aiming for. So hopefully that answers the question. So FEC, we're very comfortable with. IGA, we're beginning to record it with fully expecting it to increase accuracy, um, but we're building up the data set to do that. And Janet, you'd be right to say that we will be doing both in the foreseeable future, as opposed to just the IGA until we've built um, the data set up to get confidence. Yeah, absolutely. I, and personally, I don't think I don't think IGA itself would really replace, replace FEC for us, but I think it's probably a fairly subtle difference in what people want to do with it. And I think we've always been very clear that what we want to reduce is the contamination that sheep are producing in terms of the, the eggs that they're shedding onto the pasture and infecting other animals. And so we can measure FEC. It's not particularly pleasant collecting a poo sample from every lamb, um, but we can do it and it's reasonable heritability and we know we can breed to reduce it. Um, so, yeah. So we just, just one more question, Jenna, while we're on the breeding and diseases. Um, we've got a question here. Are we trying to identify any genetic connections with diseases or disorders? So there's such as laryngeal conjunctus, sexual throat, in other words, and its impact on longevity. Um, and how are we seeing that through some of the textile lines that we have? And probably related to that as well, Janet, although it's not in the question, is a good example would be inter eyelids. Wouldn't it? Well, inter yeah, absolutely. So so yeah, so whenever um, we lose an animal, we try and record the reason that we've lost it um, as accurately as possible. Um, and um, it, it's not always possible, is it? And we were actually reviewing our loss reasons the other day, and I think dead on field um, is a, one of the more common ones because you don't always know, although we do actually post mortem a lot of sheep now, so we, that one's reducing. But we would record anything that we were suspicious had been affected by um, laryngeal chondritis or what other people would call textile throat. 
Um, and even if an animal had been affected for it and treated for it, that would be recorded against it. Um, so we can certainly identify those animals. Um, we have a lot less of that than we used to when we started out, and I'm talking probably 10 or more years ago now, where it was um, one of our more common reasons for losing rams and even ewes. Um, when we were using a lot of um, industry texels in our lines. Um, if you see our texel lines now, they do look distinctly different to um, an industry texel. Um, and we do have, we do still get an occasional animal in across most of our lines, very occasionally, that will have laryngeal chondrosis, but it is a rarity now. Um, so it's definitely reduced. And genetic links, Janet, I don't think you found any linkages as such, we, have you? We've worked really, really hard to find genetic linkages for it. Um, and we, we've never found anything convincing. We had, did have one or two textile sires we used that seemed to have a higher frequency in some flocks, but not across all flocks. Um, but it, yeah, no, we never managed to find any convincing evidence. And we had a number of really good and large student projects that worked on that, master's projects, um, to find genetic links. So we found risk factors, but we didn't find anything genetic. Although most vets in practice will make, make a comment that it's a genetic one. <laughs> unproven, I have to say. Yeah, it is unproven. Um, the Texel Society was actually doing a research project on that, but I've not heard of any outcomes of it. So it would be really interesting to see that. Yeah. And Janet, can you give us an example of what we've done on internalis, for example, entropion, which... Yeah, yeah. Um, so with entropion, um, so that's the interned eyelids that you get in lambs. Um, again, it's always been thought to be a genetic problem. Um, it's not a simple genetic problem by any means, um, but we do know that it has a genetic influence. Um, so we record it. We're quite... Um, particular about the way it's recorded, and it's recorded on all our sheep. Um, we know the heritability of it um, is relatively low. It's around about, it's just below 10%, if I remember rightly, which means that it does have a genetic element, but there's a whole heap of other things that influence it. Again, people often ask me, what is it? But we can't identify specific risk factors. Um, but we know genetics is one, but it's a relatively weak one. Um, we actually have quite um, rigid rules about, so animals that can and can't be bred from in terms of their entropion EBV. And so we've been driving down the incidence, which started at about, in our lines, between six and 7%, which is about the national average. But in most of our lines, it's well below that now. Um, but we've certainly found that cert well, we have occasionally brought in sires and we can see a problem associated with those sires and they're out very quickly if that happens. Yeah. So. Yeah. And we also record, um, you know, anything that goes lame, anything that needs treatments across the place. Um, yeah. We try and, and monitor that, but without quite enough challenge, we don't really have robust enough data sets to do anything proper on that yet. Janet, do we? No, no. So, um, so um, come back about texel throat and said, what do we find were better to reduce the cases of texel throat? And um, I wish I could put my finger on it. Um, we, we basically were selecting our animals to perform better, to be born more easily. Um, and I think that changed their conformation. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that our texels are a different conformation to where they started. Um, they've definitely got longer necks. Um, and as a consequence of that, or associated with that, we've seen a great reduction in the cases of texel throat, but I couldn't put my finger on one thing that has caused it. Yeah, probably one of the other things is that we stop treating, to be honest with you. So if something has texel throat, we quite often try and send it to cull, or it gets a captive bolt in another way. So in many, many ways, you know, we stop trying to keep those things going we actually identify them and actually remove them from the breeding program um, with value where we can so 
but without a very clear genetic link, it's very difficult to bother hunting out the progeny, for example, yeah. um, with all of that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, hopefully that, that goes part way to, um, we've right. got lots of data sets building um, and we record all these things, but some of them aren't quite there in terms of being able to make proper selection on them yet. Yeah, but I, but I think it illustrates quite well is because what's important to us that we're breeding kind of healthy functional sheep, um, we have found without directly selecting against some things that some of these problems have disappeared for us. Um, and Texel threat is quite a nice example of that. So I told you that we use this data to make genetic progress. Let's have a look at some of the genetic progress um, that we've been making. And I'm just gonna go through it line by line um, because we said each line kind of has a specific purpose. And so we, should look at them separately, really. So we'll start with the Aberfields. So Aberfields um, are maternal. Um, one of our maternal sires kind of bred pretty much as a crossing sire, although there are self-replacing um, Aberfields available. Um, based on kind of maternal Texel and blue-faced Leicester genetics, but those original crosses were made quite a long time ago now, and we're many generations on from that point um, and have bred them very hard with um, strong selection, but also strong culling to have a good functional maternal animal, but also with a good carcass. Um, so over time, you can see um, the index, which is our overall score of performance has improved as it should. And it's improving at about four points a year. So it's kind of just ratcheting up all the time. Um, the growth and muscles of the carcass traits of the, the Aberfield have consistently improved and they've imp the rate at which they've improved isn't actually sh very short of that rate that you'd see in a terminal sire breed um, so they've kind of kept their own in terms of that um, lambing percentage is obviously really important um, in an upper field and we were quite conscious that when we um, first started out that the um, lambing percentage of the upper field probably wasn't high enough for a lot of um, customers using Aberfield cross lambs. Um, so as we stabilized the breed, we began, began to put a lot more pressure on lambing percentage by increasing its weighting in the index. Um, and you'll see that since 2018, we've seen quite significant improvements in lambing percentage. So that's the orange, the, sorry, the green points going up, the orange lines, the index. Um, so we've made improvements and it's going improving at about 1.8% on lambing percent per year since 2018. Um, so the daughters of a Aberfield ram that you buy now are likely to lamb at a much higher percentage than one that you would have bought um, some time ago. Um, at the same time as that, I said, we always have a break on new weight in our selection indexes and the intention is actually to kind of maintain new weight, not let it increase. Actually, in the upper field, it has gradually gone down um, at about only a tiny amount, at about 0.2 kilos per year. And at the same time, actually, their body condition score has gone up. So they're kind of breeding sheep that's slightly smaller and hold their condition better, which can only be good. Um, in terms of the kind of value of that, if we think of those improvements in lambing percentage, um, that's giving you more lambs at kind of only marginal extra cost in a way. So if we compare um, the returns over the lifetime of a daughter of a ram purchased, um, and I'm comparing to kind of an average ram bought in 2019, um, so who would have been born in 2018, I'm just thinking about the improvements in lambing percentage without the improvements in carcass, maternal ability, everything else. Um, the average ram that's going to be offered, the average Aberfield ram that will be offered for sale in 2023 would give you about an extra 20 quid per daughter of that ram, which is quite a nice thing to have. Um, if you go for an elite ram, so in the top 25% on index, it would be about another 41 pounds per daughter. If you really want to ramp up your lambing percentage and go for a ram that's in the top 5% for lambing percentage, that would be an extra £53 per daughter over her lifetime. Um, 
So when you think of using a RAM over, let's say, 70 years, getting a significant number of daughters from them, um, that's actually RAM is giving you quite a lot back into your pocket. Um, and although we always say we breed our lambs to last, um, this might be quite a good argument for sometimes, you know, moving rams on um, and replacing them with a new ram because the genetics coming through are better and better and you can take the advantage of that in the daughters of that ram. So keeping your ram population turning over um, is actually quite important for bringing in those genetic improvements into your flock. Um, I've also mentioned you wait, so I'm you weights um, always for me are really important traits, and we saw that the you weight in the Aberfield has gone down um, gradually. It's only a very very small reduction, um, but that's quite important that we either hold it or it goes down because, as we've said, a heavier you she's going to require much more feed. Um, she's costing you more to keep. She's also producing more methane. And you're not necessarily getting any more out of her. Um, but as long as she can produce two 20 kilo lambs, which is what we want most of our ewes to do, um, she doesn't need to be um, a particularly huge ewe. A lot of studies have looked at kind of what's the optimum weight for a ewe. And the, it seems to be in, for upland and lowland ewes in that kind of 65 to 70 kilo sweet spot, which coincidentally or not coincidentally is where most of your ewes seem to be, which is really good. Um, and that sort of you will give you the goods, she'll be efficient, she'll produce you lambs with 20 kilo carcasses, she should be able to rear twins, and you don't, you know, you don't need an 85 kilo you that's going to eat a lot more. Um, so in all our in maternal indexes, lighter ewes that hold their condition, and that proviso that they hold their condition is really important, um, are rewarded in our selection indexes. And as a consequence of that, we can make these sorts of changes. So in the Aberfield, field, we've kind of seen over this period that I've shown in the graph, lambing percentage go up by 9%, average lamb weight go up by 1.8 kilos, and they're better muscled, and fetal egg counts have come down, but the ewes have got very slightly lighter and cheaper to keep. So by having that information and using it in those indexes in that way, we can make these clever tweaks to our lines, which are quite important for efficiency. Okay, moving on to Aberdale and Abertex. Um, just check if there are any questions that we should pick up now. There is one question from Peter, uh, more or less asking, does the innovative system get its most benefit when both you and Rama are innovative bred, such as Aberfield origin? Current systems, we put Aberfield on mules with, with Peter. Um, So that's the question there, Janet, in terms of if, if you've known the genetic background. I suppose the answer to that, Peter, is that hybrid vigor plays an important part. We get quite a lot of people crisscrossing Aberfield with Highlanders, for example, um, to keep some heterosis and hybrid vigor going in there. You know, and there's nothing to stop because quite a lot of people putting Aberfields over recorded cleans and vice versa. I suppose the crucial thing is that whatever the other makeup of the breed mix you've got is, that they're being selected for the right traits and the right reasons. Um, and we wouldn't for a minute dish any mule breeders because there's some quite good mule breeders out there. So it just depends what, what selection criteria they're using, I suppose. The benefit of using Innovis and Innovis is that you know the predicted performance of both elements of it. Um, but if you were going Aberfield on Aberfield, you would need to keep an eye on mature weight so that the ewe doesn't get too big. And you'd want to probably keep those lambing percentage EBVs quite high. Um, so that probably covers that, Janet, does it? I think so. But I mean, it is actually, you know, quite a nice option, isn't it? If you've got a mule flock that you want to close up for biosecurity reasons, um, using an Aberfield on it um, and breeding your own replacements from there on is actually quite a nice system. And if anyone does do that um, and they're worried about inbreeding, if they're using Aberfield on Aberfield or Highlander on Highlander or whatever, um, it's always something to alert us to because we can actually identify rams that are not related to rams that you've previously used um, because we have that data there. So, you know, we yeah. can use the data in many different ways. Yeah. And, and then hopefully, Peter, that, that 
goes probably to answering your question. There's also a question from Clive here who had to go chasing after a dog up north in Aberdeen, I think. Um, so just to explain our colour policy again, um, we do colour an index as opposed to specific EBVs, Clive. So, so otherwise we'd be going through everything lots of times. So it's all an overall index and anything below that overall index tends to get dropped out under the 50% the mark normally, Janet, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I very occasionally, I think if a breeding partner um, has a specific trait that they want to address um, and they've got, if you like, spare culling capacity because they're already got quite high index animals and we do have a number of breeding partners will do that. They may hone in on a specific trait and an EBV, but usually it's on index and people, yeah, we find that by doing that, they get a flock that works well. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the Abidale and Abitech. So this is our kind of longest standing line. So Texel based genetics. Um, the Abidale carries the infidel gene, um, which will um, make them more prolific. Um, so typically scanning around about 200%, but that takes some careful management. Um, they can scan a lot higher. Um, the Abitex is a kind of maternal bred Texel, and it's, it goes alongside with the um, Abidale line in that um, the way that the Invidel gene works is that not all animals are going to carry it. So if they don't carry it, um, they're an Abitex. We also have some um, Abitex flocks that just breed Abitex, so they're kind of don't have the Invidel there at all. So we've been working on these for a long time. Um, index just gradually notches up year by year, about two points a year, so they're constantly improving. Um, growth and muscle continues to improve. Um, again, very much at the sort of rate you'd expect a terminal sire to. Um, so they still actually make quite good terminal sires, and a number of people will use Abitex for that. Um, the lambing percentage um, is increasing in the Abitex. Um, we keep um, a lid on it in the Abidale because the Invidale does the job um, in terms of increasing prolificacy in the Abidale. Um, but it is increasing in the Abitex, so it's kind of increasing, making it an even better maternal taxel. And U weight is pretty much holding, very, very slight decrease of about 0.1 kilo a year. Um, and yeah. fecal egg counts going down over time. It's probably worth just giving you a little insight into how this line has chopped and changed over the years. When we first set up the taxel population, we brought sheep from shearling breeders up in the borders. Richard O, Charles Scott, um, some some big shearling producers with very functional Texel sheep, really good breeders that have been performance recording commercial tubs for years. Um, and that was the basis of the flock, really, but we weren't quite happy with their functionality. Um, so we did bring New Zealand Texels in, into the mix. And again, all that really had quite a good impact in terms of functional traits but everything became a little bit woollier and everything became a little bit um, less texely. So we've been sort of trying to stabilize. We still bring in New Zealand texels, but quite often to go in to produce new lambs that actually go back through the breeding program. Um, and that'll be, uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Janet, but it's creating a functional sheep, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that, that, that very dramatic change in the lines that you see in 2014, 2015, there's actually two New Zealand effects on that. There's some New Zealand rams that we brought in that were particularly good and effective that gave us a massive boost. We also had a New Zealand shepherd working with us um, for a couple of years then, and he went did an absolutely ruthless cull through the Abitale and the Abitex line, um, which almost had me weeping in terms of the number of sheep that we were losing. Um, at the time, but actually, you, when you can see, it's it's, it's combined effect of the two things, but it um, did a, a massive job. Um, and sometimes that needs to be done. Um, moving on to the Highlander. So the Highlander um, is a breed of sheep that we breed with focused genetics in New Zealand. It was developed um, in New Zealand, um, originally by Rissington and then taken into the focus genetics fold. Um, and we maintain very strong links um, genetically and otherwise with focus genetics. So 
um, we keep the Highlander population linked to the New Zealand Highlander population, um, as well as recording it in our own system. Certainly our nucleus Highlanders are also recorded on SIL, um, so we can kind of keep that link as well. And we can make sure that, um, you know, I guess it's another check on data, isn't it? Um, the Highlander has always been um, a very functional sheep um, with a kind of almost optimum lambing percentage, kind of in that high 190s. Um, fantastic maternal ability, um, great lambing ease, lamb survival, and a, a smaller U. Um, so we kind of always felt those traits were about right. Um, and in terms of genetic progress, what we wanted to do was hold those traits at around where they are. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Um, but we wanted to improve the kind of carcass characteristics um, of the Highlander. Um, so if in our own breeding program in this country, I put quite a lot of emphasis on that and have seen um, good improvement in that. Um, and also keeping pressure on driving those fecal egg counts down, which have continued to go down. Um, it can be a bit of a rocky journey sometimes um, with importing sheep that you don't quite know how they're going to fit into your breeding program. Um, and you can see the, the effects of some of that in those genetic trends. I don't know if you want to add anything, Dowie. Yeah, the blip in 2018 there is... Or was it 1819? We we actually brought in rams and they just didn't deliver, did they? So no. And unfortunately, with a maternal breed, it takes quite a long time to work that out. Um I was constantly saying, Oh, be patient with them. We can't judge them until their daughters have come through the flock and they've had a couple of crops of lambs. We don't really get the measure of them. But unfortunately, we have got to the stage now where we have got the measure of them. Um, yeah. So moving on to our terminal sires. Um, so the Avamax, which again started as um, it's a composite breed with um, Texel and Charolais genetics in, um, which were very carefully selected to develop the breed. But again, we haven't gone back to those original breeds for many generations now. So it's very much a kind of stabilized composite. We're not scared to bring something new in if we think it's going to add something. Um, but actually very little has been brought in for the Avamax that has added anything. So it is pretty much that original mix. Um, so we see great genetic improvement in the Avamax. The index goes up by about eight points a year. Um, we've made big improvements in lambing ease, lamb vigor, lamb survival over the years with them and seen really significant changes um, in those traits. Um, but at the same time, those traits that we'd expect to improve in a terminal sire, and we would want to improve in a terminal sire, so the growth, the muscle, the fat have also improved. And the chart kind of gives you an idea of the relative improvement in traits. It can be quite difficult to compare because we're measuring traits in very different units. So I've kind of standardized them so we can compare them here. And you can see, you know, there's a lot of improvement going on, as there should be in the muscling and the growth of the Abermax. Fat depths are going up slightly, although it has a negative weighting in the index. And that's exactly why it has a negative weighting in the index. Because when we're really driving muscle depth and growth up, we'd expect um, fat to also go up. So we need a negative weighting to kind of keep a cap on that. But we also do want it to, we're not too worried about it going up because we want those lambs to be able to finish. We don't want to drive carcass weights up so high that lambs aren't finishing. Um, so that's something that's very important. We keep a close eye on that um, in our customers' flocks as to kind of the carcass weights they're getting. And we're always welcoming feedback on that if people can give it to us. Um, you, but you can also see that lamb survival, lambing vigor, lambing ease have all gone up quite nicely. And birth weight has pretty much stayed stable over the years. Um, and entropian, the instance of entropian has been going down steadily. Um, the other max is a really good point to talk a little bit more about lamb survival. So lamb survival, those lambs that are lost between scanning and sale, um, are a really lost opportunity for any flock. I don't need to tell you that, you know, um, and from the poll that we did earlier, it looks like a lot of you are kind of on your game very much as regards lamb survival. But, you know, every, every lamb we lose is um, you fed the ewe to rear, to get that lamb to birth and you've lost it. So you're getting no return. Um, 
So I've always been a pain in the ass about lamb survival with um, in our breeding program. Um, dead lambs are really rigorously recorded and evaluated. Every dead lamb has to be recorded and accounted for, else I'm not happy. Um, and, and that's a really important part of our data quality that we're getting really good data on our dead lambs. Um, because if we don't know about the dead lambs, we can't get a good genetic evaluation for lamb survival. Um, but we do get really good data on our dead lambs um, and we get good lamb survival EBVs, which are included in that lambing sub-index, which is designed to basically reduce lamb survival as much as we can and also make lambs born easily, so increase lambing ease. But it's included as an integral part of every meat line selection index. And it's important because your terminal sire, you think of it in terms of growth and muscle um, and that carcass of the lamb, but that lamb survival is going to make a difference to the number of lambs that reach sale. And that can have a really big economic um, effect. So I've just done a, what I call a back of a fag packet calculation. And Dowie always says me, tells me it's not politically correct, but you know <laughs> what I mean. Some rough calculations. Um, so if you've got a 500 ewe flock, lambing at 180 percent and you increase lamb survival by two percent um, which isn't a huge increase um, it might be a struggle for our one respondent who was had less than five percent losses but for most other people you could easily increase lamb survival by two percent that's another about 18 lambs um, that you'd have to sell and thinking you're selling them at 20 kilo carcass and the average price last year was what Five pounds fifty a kilo dead weight. We're looking about eighteen hundred quid um, for not a lot, other than having bought a ram with good lamb survival EBVs. Um, it starts to make a lot of economic sense, and it starts to feel a bit unwise not to think about lamb survival and lamb survival EBVs. Um, so in the Abermax, we've seen our in the Abermax index go up over the years, but also that lamb survival increasing. Um, and I always like to check it, you know, we can see upwardly pointing graphs with EVVs, um, which are lovely. I always like to check it against what's happening in the flocks. And we see that lamb survival or the lamb losses coming down year on year in our breeding flocks, um, which is great. So lamb survival, really, really important in all rams that you buy. Um, so the Primera, another a meat sire of ours. Again, this is a line that's developed by Focus Genetics. They've developed it um, as a Focus Prime in New Zealand. Um, we have the Primera um, in the UK. Um, so it's a very fast growing, um, high lean meat yield breed, um, but also really suited for using on hogs or lambing outside because really good lambing ease, really good lamb survival. Um, Lambing ease in our breeding partner flocks, we have regularly, we have a number of flocks that just don't assist any lambs. I don't think we have any flocks that have more than 2% assistance of primary lambs. Um, they just pop them out, um, which is worth a lot. Um, so we see really good improvements in index year on year in the primary, and that is in growth muscle and fat primarily. So they continue to improve. And you can see, I've got a similar graph I, as I had for the Abermax, we're getting, you know, really high improvements in weight, um, growth to eight weeks and up to 18 weeks and also muscle depth. Fat depth increasing slightly, um, but again, that helps make sure the lambs will finish. Um, lamb survival and lamb vigor are improving. Um, lambing ease is a fairly constant, but it's actually really, really difficult to improve when you haven't got much of a problem. Um, and there's actually not a huge amount of variation in our Primera population in terms of lambing ease. So it's, you know, it, it's, we're probably close to our optimum on that and it's difficult to improve. You'll see that birth weight has been creeping up, um, which is interesting and it kind of emphasizes why it is important to monitor traits like that. Um, we're not worried about it at the moment because that lambing ease is still really good. So, but it's something we could keep a close eye on um, and make sure that it's not getting out of hand. And then the Aber Black, so our Suffolk-based um, line. Um, so 
designed to kind of do a lot of what Suffolk did, um, but without the extreme confirmation with being much easier lambing, much better lamb survival, lambs that have got real get up and go, but still fast growing, good for early lambing, good confirmation, good muscle um, and good finishing carcasses. And also making quite a nice um, ram if you want to keep terminal cross use. So that traditional Suffolk cross you, you have a black kind of replaces the Suffolk in that really well. Um, so one of our more recent lines and one of our smaller lines, but very popular um, with ram buyers, um, increasing nicely year on year at about six points a year, growth, muscle and fat all increasing in them. Um, and I'll put that in context in a minute, but lambing ease and survival, we've seen really substantial improvements in the population. Um, so a really good all purpose um, terminal sire that will give you those dark faced lambs. Um, if we look at those improvements in growth and muscle, it kind of puts those improvements in fat um, in context. So we've seen growth and muscle go up really substantially in the line. We've seen a slight increase in fat, but it's only very slight. It's very small increases. So again, it's not it's it's something that just keeps it to the point where lambs should be easy enough to finish off grass, um, which is quite important. Um, Dowie always on this graph, Dowie always asked me about that muscle depth going down in 2022. Um, a number of our other black breeders had a really rough year in 2022 with really severe drought conditions. Um, and we had a very big discussion about whether we should actually use the scanning data or even scan the lambs because we felt that they'd been put under such extreme conditions. But I was actually really keen that we did scan them. Um, and that we use the data in the evaluations because unfortunately I think we're going to get those sorts of conditions more and more and what we really want to do is breed sheep that are relatively resilient to those conditions every sheep's going to be badly affected by some of the extreme conditions we saw this year but some sheep actually continued to grow and continue to put on muscle or uh, others didn't um, so we actually did use the data in the evaluation so that might slightly explain that dip um, we'll see over time um, if that's the case. The other thing that we've done in the Aber Black population this last breeding season was we compromised a little bit on some of the indexes to, of the sires being used in order to strengthen genetic links between flocks. So they may, that may also have contributed to that very slight dip. But sometimes that's just what you have to do. Um, and finally, last but not least, our Inverse Cheviot. Um, so uh, very much a work in progress um, and for a maternal breed, um, you need a number of years to really get um, to grips with it, to build the data up on the flock um, and to start making forward movement. So I haven't got a nice upwardly pointing graph view here because it is very much a work in progress. Um, we've got two Cheviot flocks we're currently recording, um, a North Country based flock um, at Southfield, Hoyk, um, and then an elven up chuck, a flock uh, in the Yarrow Valley, which is South Country, South is, um, which have been recorded since 2020, a much smaller um, body weight you. And the South is are in the picture, Jenny. Yeah, it's the South is looking wonderful in that picture. <laughs> um, so what we've been doing with them so far, we've been, um, we've bought a recorded flock for the North is, the elven up flock was established on the farm and not recorded. So we've been recording performance and we're doing that both through our own system and on Signet. Um, and we've doing, been doing a heck of a lot of culling um, to make sure we've got ewes that are really working for our systems. Um, and also trying to get the type consistent and right for what we think will make a saleable ram within the flock. Um, but at the same time, um, we have been keeping an eye on indexes and breeding. Um, from the better indexed animals, if we can, as long as they meet those other criteria. Um, and certainly, um, if we look at the signet indexes, we're seeing some nice progress. So the average um, index of our lambs in 2022 was 199. This is in the north. Is, um, that's compared to a breed average of 122. So, and I think the top 10% was 188 or something. So they're kind of very much up there. 
and the ewes that have gone to the top this autumn um, were on average 180 index. So they're kind of starting off 58 above breed average. Um, so it will our index will only be going up from there with that sort of selection pressure going on. So it's a very much a work in progress. We want to be able to breed a very functional um, hill sheep that's got data behind it, but it just takes time to build up that data. And it's probably worth mentioning, Janet, we are in discussions with both societies. We will register a handful of these sheep just to give those options to customers. Yeah. So subject to them being happy with the flock and everything else. So we need to go through those procedures first. Yeah. And that is also one of the reasons that we record these with Signet. I and mean, there's a, a number of different reasons why we record them with Signet. But it, it's only good for us and good for everybody else if people who have purebred cheviot flocks are recording them with Signet. Um, and so we want people to be able to use rams that have Signet records in them um, to just encourage that recording. Um, so uh, just just the question from Clive, who's an avid Chiviot yes. and Highlander. Um, can we say a bit more about what selection pressure criteria we're focusing on with the North Country flock? Um, probably from a functional point of view, Clive, we we've halved the flock from when we bought it, just because you behavior, their performance wasn't very good. Um, they are actually quite good maternal use now. They stick with their lambs. We can, although we use DNA. Um, to allocate the lambs to the mothers, we still uh, spot mark those lambs to the five, six day window when they've lambed. And those ewes are sticking with their, their lambs quite nicely. They scanned at 172% in Southfield last year. Um, we haven't scanned this year yet properly, so but they're getting up there um, and actually becoming quite nice sheep. In terms of their ability, they have to, although Southfield isn't really a hill farm by any stretch of the imagination, it's an upland unit. They get the rough ground all the time. They get pushed up um, wherever possible. So they're not being mollycoddled. Um, we have brought rams in that are unrecorded. Um, we brought a couple from Joyce last year, the year before. We brought one from Katrine and Gareth Price. So we have put new genetics in there and recorded because we simply needed to open up the, the genetic pool just to try and actually put stuff in there. But at the same time, work on the phenotype and structure just to make sure things are they have the legs where they should be so um yeah but what's quite nice to see is that even some of those industry flocks <clears throat> that have no background to them um, are starting to pull up in figures so just because sheep out there aren't recorded doesn't mean to say that there aren't very good sheep out there in the trivia population um it's just actually starting to record them to make that work really but um, they get no concentrates. They have to work quite hard for the living, these ewes. Um, and yeah, they're, they're actually becoming quite a handy sheep. Okay, so I'm, then I'm gonna hand over to Dowie to um, talk a bit about making the most of your Inovis Ram. Yeah, we're not gonna dwell too much because I think people are saturated. <laughs> I am if no one else is. Yeah. So um, we won't, um, thank you, Janet, for giving us as usual, you know, very down to earth um, presentation. Um, I think, Laurie, you've got a quick question of on on people and what they what they how they use their rams. So again, what we discussed before was very much, you know, we've talked about the breeding of these animals, be with Inivis or somebody else, anybody really, but it's actually trying to work out the cost of that ram as the means of getting genetics into the flock is quite important. And quite often isn't the price you pay for the ram. It's much more along the lines of how many ewes that ram covers and how many um, seasons that lamb ra lasts. So again, just a very quick click and we'll, we'll finish on this really. Um, we just like to know if you could, in your U to ram ratio, you know, so in other words, not excluding ram lambs, you know, how hard do you work your current ram population? be it Inuvis or other sheep you've got on the farm. So you see there's a range there below 40, right up to over the 100. And also then how many seasons do you expect currently your rams to cover within all of that? So if you'd be good just to give us a quick click, just to wake us up before we finish. Again, it's just useful for us to understand that in the industry. So um, I assume, Lodi, the votes are in, are they? 
Oh, do we need to give it a couple more minutes, maybe, for people to think? Sometimes this is quite a difficult one because you have the number of rams you have, and and there's always mix and matching. You put things with your lambs, you you use them on other things. So there aren't sort of clear answers on some of those sometimes, and likewise with the seasons one. Um, but um, let's pull it up, Lord, so we can so we can see what it looks like. So some of you using them on low numbers. Now, again, that could be pedigree flocks that are doing single sound meetings so or specific meetings. But we would urge if it is, then if, if it's not that, then obviously you should think about using your rams more effectively. Um, a decent number pushing up to these levels um, of, of 60 to 70, 70 to 80. So nice spread. And some of you even pushing them um, up to that level. Um, I'm just going to put very quickly um, um, a little tool we've got on the Inovis, um website. So for you to have a look at when you get a chance. So I hope that's up, Janet, is it? Yes. So on the Inovis website, if you get a chance, just go in there. You can actually put the price of your RAM. You can be whatever it wants to be. It can be, well, let's start with something cheaper. Let's start with a 400 quid RAM. Um, I think the industry average is about 45 views to the RAM based on Leslie Stubbings and Kate Phillips' studies. And I think the average lifetime on that sheep um, was probably about three seasons. So when you actually take that into the equation, your cost for mating is actually about £2.96 per U tupped. Now, obviously, if that's a more expensive RAM and you've paid 800 quid for that RAM, um, it's actually quite a substantial cost per U. Um, within all of that. Now, the Innovis Rams last, or I think this year, averaged about 820 quid from memory. Um, so I'll just put that as an actual in. And from the feedback we get from our customers, the average U to RAM ratio was 70 to the top. And the average working life of these Rams based on last year's questionnaires was four and a half seasons. So that's sort of a target we'd expect. If you're paying that sort of money for a Ram, they should be covering you eight TUs. And they should be giving you at least four seasons, hopefully a bit more. Obviously, if you can push it up to like some people were doing right up to that sort of 80, 90 use, um, then obviously that, that becomes quite a substantial number. So that's quite a useful little tool. So again, we've talked about the breeding, but we just thought it'd be useful just to actually um, get that up for people so you can see um, that there's quite a variation depending on how these rams um perform and for that it's obviously quite important you know vaccinate those rams when you're vaccinating the ewes just to sort of protect that investment to make sure you actually got them um, protected in there so i think probably like i say i think people are um probably had enough sheep talk for one day so thank you ever so much for bearing with us the majority of you have stayed on and um so yeah we thank you very much for your time this evening hopefully you found it useful um, there are no questions in the chat, so we assume, like I say, that people just want to <laughs> switch this off and go have a brew or go to bed. So, um, yeah, so there will be a recording, I think. Laurie will circulate that to people if you want it. Um, and there were some people that didn't manage to make it on tonight, so we can send that to them as well. Um, the next webinar we've got is actually meeting our breeding partners, I think, um, where we'll be rolling out some of these dots that you saw on that map that Janet shared. So again, it's always really useful to make sure that, you know, get their views on it all, um, see the philosophy behind it. And hopefully you'll see that actually a lot of this um, making sense. Um, I see there's one comment in there saying tricky to decide how long you keep your interest up without losing out on the next advancements. And that's absolutely true. What we do yeah. encourage for that is that we do have a portal on some of my livestock, um, an Innovis portal. And we do encourage people if you've used your tub for, you know, two or three generations. And obviously you can extend the working life of your maternal tub by putting your young ewes to a terminal to meet RAM. So that stretches you another year or two before they come to meet them again. Um, then there is a there is a market out there for, if you like, used pre-loved RAMs. Um, uh, we can't sell them through the end of his sort of sales because of the health, because we, we're never sure on the health profile of, of flocks. Um, but we are happily put them up on the on the end of his portal through Summer Livestock. And we do see quite a few rams that are three, four, five-year-olds 
actually being traded and doing another two or three years for somebody else, obviously bought at a at a lower price. So we're more than happy to help you um, with that. You know, speak to the nearest sales rep or the office, and they can put those steps on the portal for you. And hopefully that enables you then um, to actually, if you like, get a genetic upgrade, if that's what you want to call it, and to get some of the sheep moving forward. But we absolutely understand if you've got a fit tap that's five years old, that's going to six season, which many of them are, then that's quite a difficult decision to just cull it. So, yeah, but um, yeah, it's it's an option for people to consider anyway. And on that note, um, I think we will pull things to um, uh, what's the goal in 10 years? <laughs> uh, I assume that's for the business um, or for the sheep. Uh, in terms of the business, um, we continue to grow. Um, we have about 200 new customers coming on board every year, obviously, because Rams cover a reasonable number of views and last a fairly good time, which we're very happy about. It means that you need a reasonable pipeline of farmers coming in into the system all the time. So we continue to grow. Um, we are always developing new lines. Janice talked about the chiviots. Um, we are also developing a, a shedding line. Um, work in progress very much along that. We are also embarking on some uh, methane, direct methane measurements um, that will hopefully reduce the carbon footprint of our maternal lines for people that'll empower you to be able to hit some of the matrixes that the government are wanting so it's to grow the business sensibly um for those that want to change or those that see the opportunity um and hopefully keep ourselves honest in doing so um and we continually innovate that's really our job we have to um do the hard yards really so that we can actually justify you guys coming to buy from us every year and that's very much the mantra we take on board you know that that we have to do a job and our breeding pandas likewise um to to justify the custom we get from from people so but yeah breeding, so, breeding is long term and we are constantly asking ourselves what sheep's going to be needed in 10 years time so we are you know yes. constantly thinking about that yeah neither janet nor i had gray hair when we started this <laughs> so but there we go anyway thank you all and and have a very good evening and hopefully we'll see some of you in the next webinar when we're discussing our breeding partners and you you can see the characters involved there and on that we will call it an evening